a few minutes late already. Um, so uh, welcome back, everyone. I hope you had a good night. I hope um, <clears throat> I hope no one's uh, in jail this morning. I haven't had any text messages yet, so I I worry more about not the Pisces group, but the uh, faculty more than anything else. Um, it's um, it's a real pleasure to uh, have uh, our next speaker, who uh, uh, actually I would have liked to be here for the whole time, but uh, unfortunately had a visiting professor yesterday in Denver. So uh, John Carroll is a guy who's really in a um, really in a position to really know everything about the landscape of intervention uh, in the United States and uh, pretty much globally. So John is um, the PI of the RESPECT trial, and uh, given the recent uh, approval in the U.S. for the St. Jude PFO device, uh, really it's the RESPECT trial that's totally driven that, and I think he's uniquely, uh, uniquely positioned to talk to you in, the, in this area. He's also on the transcatheter valve, uh, the TVT reg uh, registry, a steering committee, and so he has a lot of insight into what's going on in the U.S., where we're going, what types of things are problems, and he's going to speak to that later in the day. Uh, so um, without further ado, uh, John Carroll. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be here, and sounds like yesterday was really an exciting time. Uh, so three different companies <laughs> have uh, been involved in respect uh, over the, the past uh, I think 14 years that I've been involved. So this is where it really starts, where we have uh, a young person free of the burdens of vascular risk factors who presents with a stroke. Um, someone you would, last person you would think having a stroke and lo and behold, what do they have? Uh, they have an occluded MCA uh, and fortunately uh, uh, with uh, direct reperfusion, uh, uh, she ended up with minimal minimal uh, residual neurological deficit. But then the whole question comes, where did that clot come from? And how can we pre prevent it again? Uh, she's not hypertensive, she's not diabetic, she doesn't smoke. There's no traditional risk factor to modify. So closing PFOs in people like this has been very controversial. And it's in fact gotten in some areas of the country, the U.S., uh, so controversial that now you have a website of a law firm talking about uh, people who got inappropriate PFO closure, uh, perhaps uh, bringing uh, legal suits. And you add to that the obviously challenging area that this has been for over a decade that to develop the kind of uh, strong evidence we all would like to see before we perform an intervention, knowing that it's the right thing to do, that the benefits uh, clearly outweigh the risks, uh, it's taken a long time. And there have been challenges uh, such that it's not like, uh, you know, the, for the people enrolled in these clinical trials, they couldn't have overt venothrombolic manifestations. So it's all presumptive that they had a paradoxical embolism. Something that I think uh, congenital-based uh, uh, cardiologists acknowledge, can paradoxical embolism is a real factor, but it's uh, uh, less so uh, in the adult world, and certainly less so when you talk to a neurologist, that, that that's, that's a stretch. Um, and then you've got the confounder that PFO is really not an abnormality. It's an innocent remnant of the fetal circulation, and it's present in, in many adults and is, is really an incidental finding. That really confounds the um, uh, clinical trial design. And then you have the problem that uh, there were a lot of observational data that came out 15 plus years ago. And Marty Leon had, I don't think he'll like uh, going down in history of, of saying that he predicted that PFO closure is going to be one of the most common cath lab procedures uh, back then. That's the way, that's the, the hoopla that kind of presented uh, everyone in this this area and and it really made it uh, challenging to do a clinical trial 
um, when uh, you already had the active treatment available um, down the street. And uh, across the pond, um, you had very different regulatory environment such that uh, getting PFO uh, devices out there for people to use was even easier. And so like uh, there's this great review, 11 PFO closure devices were commercially available in Italy alone in 2012. So an amazing international uh, way of a new therapy rolling out. And this is a complex slide, uh, which I apologize for, but when you look at the uh, horizontal top axis, you, you see the years and below it, uh, in the yellow, you see the, the various randomized trials. And the PC trial started enrolling in 2000, 17 years ago. <laughs> Where were you 17 years ago? Um, and it sh this shows the various clinical trials. And, and importantly, it also shows down um, with the final three trials uh, that are randomized clinical trials. Uh, uh, two of them, close and reduce, are, are about to be uh, presented, which will help our uh, uh, knowledge of these areas. And I certainly look at these clinical trials not as, as uh, wins versus loses, but do they add to our knowledge? And down below is kind of the, what uh, was going on in terms of other devices that could be used for PFO closure. Cardio seal that was approved for VSD closure was the same that was uh, being used in a clinical trial. So uh, an interesting uh, way of doing a trial. So it all comes down to uh, the paradigm that for many interventional therapies, we truly need long-term results that six months, two years is really inadequate for many of the things, especially if you're talking about an interventional uh, uh, device where you, it's preventing something. It's not treating symptoms. It's not like TAVI. It's not like MitraClip. It's not like ASD closure. This is all about preventing um, a stroke, and so that makes it uh, difficult. But there are many good things about having long-term follow-up. You really get an idea of not only the safety of the device, but you study these patients over a long period of time. And um, you know, guess what? We really have to uh, put pathophysiologic studies, natural history studies uh, embedded in clinical trials sponsored by industry because it's so hard to get funding for these studies otherwise. So we try to uh, learn from these studies. So this is right after FDA panel. And, um, and this represents to me, not only have I been working with these people with over a year, uh, but uh, essential this area moving forward, just like within these clinical trials, is that partnership with uh, stroke neurology. Uh, to me, that's so, so essential to uh, optimize patient care. And, uh, and I've been to a couple stroke meetings lately and uh, found the neurology community is very open to new data uh, presented and uh, we'll, we'll be publishing that. So this is what happened on October 28th is this device that many people in the room have seen for a long time uh, got uh, approved. You know, the first time it was put in was in um, Switzerland uh, by Bernie. Meyer with uh, Kurt Amplot's present um, and uh, the various FDA documents, the approval letter, the announcement, the summary, the safety and effectiveness data are um, all, these are links uh, toward it. It's very important to read the indications of use because I think the FDA did a good job of trying to uh, focus on that. It just didn't say, oh, it's approved for PFO closure. It's really all about secondary prevention, ischemic stroke, predominantly, although it didn't restrict uh, age-wise, cryptogenic stroke due to presumed paradoxical embolism, because you can rarely, rarely really prove that, as determined by neurologists and cardiologists. So it really um, puts into FDA labeling a multidisciplinary approach, which is, which is unique. 
So uh, what happened in this field, uh, and how did we ever get to the threshold of FDA approval, which was reasonable assurances of efficacy and safety? And first and foremost, uh, it is about the patients we enrolled in clinical trials. Their, their willingness to participate in these trials is, is critical. And the majority, even though we had dropouts uh, for various reasons, the majority hung in there. And that's not easy, especially when you're dealing with a relatively young patient population in a mobile society. Uh, you know, again, the clinical sites were both Canadian and U.S. And, uh, you know, it's a pain in the ass to be in a clinical study and to be followed for 10 years plus. Things change in people's lives. So the, just a review, the patient flow was um, people were, were enrolled. Uh, they were assigned before um, uh, randomization to what would be their medical regimen, and in respect, we used the guideline uh, directed options for patients after cryptogenic stroke. So that means there was a diversity of the medical arm, and so one has to be cautious about interpreting uh, the medical arm because it's really mixed, and it was not a randomized comparison of different uh, agents. Uh, the one-to-one -one randomization uh, occurred, and you know one of the issues is that some people randomized to device. Uh, we had three people before they got a device had strokes, and in a trial where you have relatively low frequency of event rates, that can really um, be a challenge statistically and also clinically. And then the follow-up was was pre-specified in the protocol. We did specify that we were doing long-term follow-up, um, which I think was was good in the long term. So relatively young patients, um, um, yes, they had some uh, burden of cardiovascular risk factors, stroke risk factors, but not a lot. But if you look at the final three things on this. I'll come back to number one uh, that that uh, history of DVT is, is considerably higher than in the general population of this age. Uh, we did, you know, I was concerned we were going to be enrolling just very low risk people because if they had anything that made people like cardiologists worried, they just uh, close them, not enroll them in the trial, but we had a lot of people with atrial septal aneurysm and substantial shunt with the rather loose uh, quantification of greater than 20 bubbles at rest or after provocation in the left atrium within three beats of arriving, arriving in the right. Um, <clears throat> as people in this room know, this is a fairly straightforward uh, intervention that should have a very high rate of success and a very, very low rate of serious adverse events. Uh, at the time of the late follow-up, uh, people had been in the trial quite a bit, and you can see the differential follow-up because in the medical management arm, there were people who dropped out, who said, well, it's been five years. I'm going to go down the street and get my PFO closed. And so, but there still were a substantial number of patients who were in there for a long period of time. And just taking a slice of data at, uh, during follow-up in terms of differential medical therapy, and that's important to realize that most of the patients who got devices were also on medical therapy long-term, specifically aspirin. And that's a fundamental lesson learned that um, it, PFO closure should not be looked upon as curative of ever having a stroke again. It's one component of a comprehensive secondary stroke prevention uh, strategy. And on the right side, the, in the medical arm, uh, warfarin was allowed. And, um, and in those randomized to the device, there were 113 patients who got randomized to the device arm who came to the trial enrollment who are already on warfarin, and we stopped the warfarin protocol mandated in those patients. And that uh, is relevant to something we saw. So there were two there are two analyses that really form this. There was the initial analysis from 2012 that was driven by we reached 25 endpoints, which were recurrent ischemic strokes. Uh, no other endpoint was was reached, and that was by the uh, protocol when we had to uh, look at the data and, and publish it. And that's where we missed the, in the intention to treat arm, uh, a p-value of 0 0.08, despite a, a, a 
clear difference in risk of recurrent stroke. It did not reach statistical significance. If you look at other populations other than intention to treat like as treated per protocol, it was significant, but this is the gold standard intention to treat. The final analysis, May 2016, was actually after the FDA panel. After the panel, the FDA said, go back and get one more look at the outcomes of these patients. And that's where uh, the statistical significance was reached. And you can see the number of events went from 25 up to uh, 46 uh, in long-term follow-up. So that helped uh, solidify that there was a significant reduction of recurrent strokes in the device arm versus the medical management arm. So uh, the initial results we published in 2013, the long-term results should be published in the next uh, month or so, um, that it's finally uh, been accepted. And uh, Jeff Saver, who is the head of stroke neurology at UCLA, uh, did a great job responding to uh, reviewers galore, especially uh, concerned about statistical aspects of the study, uh, which uh, were handled quite well. So, you know, you, you write a, a clinical trial, your primary endpoint, you try to stick to that, and um, it's great if you reach that superiority that we were looking for, but you don't stop there. There are lessons to be learned, and one of the lessons to be learned is that PFO closure can only prevent one kind of mechanism for stroke, not all strokes. So there are going to be other kinds of strokes, and in fact, that probably would be the proper primary endpoint of recurrent strokes of an unknown cause or cryptogenic that could be paradoxical embolism. So we looked at that uh, in terms of the third bar here, ischemic strokes without known mechanism, which clearly showed a relative risk for reduction of 62. That requires adjudication by uh, a neurology team looking at uh, stroke mechanisms of these uh, recurrent strokes, which is a, a challenging area. There's one lesson I've learned is that figuring out a stroke mechanism is not easy, and, um, and it's kind of probabilistic. And so we looked at the data another way. We really, this was focused on younger patients, like younger than 60. So if you censor the patients at the age of 60 and don't go into uh, what could be debated as, as the, whether or not you can really look at stroke mechanisms, but just keep to the target population age group, then it was significant. And then you look at those people in the study who had uh, what we call, quote, high-risk anatomy, which there's some controversy, and you really see a significant uh, treatment effect. In fact, in fact, that 72% relative risk reduction was close to the 75% risk reduction that we put into the original trial design 14, 15 years ago, which was uh, perhaps uh, overly enthusiastic. And this just shows the Kaplan-Meier uh, curves of the recurrent strokes of undetermined cause. Uh, with the red being those with PFO closure and those uh, blue being those in medical management. Uh, and it's the intention to treat. So it doesn't uh, really look at device effect. It looks at the randomization strategy, which is the way you do it. And interestingly, you know, we, we learned from uh, other PFO closure trials that people having recurrent strokes started having them from other mechanisms. And in fact, about a third of the recurrent strokes in respect have had a known mechanism, uh, more commonly in the device than the medical arm. Um, uh, but things like AFib, in fact, uh, related strokes uh, were more common in the um, medical arm, three uh, AFib-related strokes in the medical one in the device, which is important because if you remember uh, closure was significantly contaminated by the device causing AFib, device thrombus, and so you're trying to prevent a stroke, you put a device in, and lo and behold, uh, in some of those patients, you cause a stroke. Um, so we didn't see that, which was very uh, reassuring. Uh, and also, the, you know, with long-term follow-up, it means that um, uh, almost a quarter of the patients in respect, when we did extended uh, follow-up uh, were over the age of 60. They had aged and they developed a variety of different risk factors for stroke. 
when we now that we have statistical significance and intention to treat in the in the uh, uh, primary endpoint of the study, you can legitimately statistically look into subgroup analysis. Age wasn't a major, sex wasn't a major, but shunt size substantial was a uh, uh, you know, predicted of uh, greater treatment effect. The presence of an atrial septal aneurysm was another uh, factor. And uh, importantly, uh, even though we excluded the vast majority of lacunar strokes, um, still deep strokes, uh, and this is important when you're selecting patients, you should wonder whether it was a PFO mediated stroke or not versus cortical stroke. So certainly when we see these pe people in clinic, uh, that makes a big difference in terms of whether we think they may benefit or not. And uh, certainly compared to aspirin, it favors device. And so this anticoagulation with warfarin, that's an interesting finding, but it doesn't really, it was, the trial was not designed to look at different medical strategies. So looking at, you know, the, it was a small difference between the groups in one year, but was significant is that it increased. Uh, over each year. And then if you looked at this patient population that many of us th thought, geez, this is the kind of the anatomical physiological foundation for paradoxical uh, embolism. Uh, and you should look at really long-term differences in outcomes in people who are 40 years old because it's not, they're not looking from their perspective of what happens to me in the next year, they're saying in the next decade what happens. And so that's where you start to see a pretty major reduction of recurrent stroke risk that really comes home as clinically very important. And then it, as a result, it drops the number needed to treat to much lower number than uh, with uh, many other ways of reducing stroke risk. So fairly compelling. So uh, we learn from data. Uh, we try to provide clinical insights to help us make patient-specific um, um, decisions and, and present the data so they can make the decision of what they want. And so PFO closure, again, cannot prevent strokes from non-PFO related causes, which says, again, we have to look at comprehensive secondary stroke. So what about uh, complications? Then there, there certainly were some. Uh, but importantly, you know, in this trial that involved, uh, I think, 69 sites, many of them uh, weren't particularly experienced, um, uh, but a straightforward intervention. So fortunately, there were, we didn't see things like device thrombosis, device erosion. Fortunately, with the PFO device appears to be uh, much more infrequent than with the ASO device. And so uh, good, a good job. Uh, there is a DSMB. They adjudicated SAEs. Uh, atrial fibrillation was somewhat imbalanced. And if you took all AFib, not just the SAEs, uh, um, it was in, uh, un it was unbalanced, uh, but uh, there were the periprocedural AFibs that I think we all know we can cause by uh, manipulating uh, catheters within the right and left atrium. Uh, if you exclude those, the uh, long-term AFib rate was equivalent between the two arms. Uh, death, uh, all the deaths were not uh, related to the study, the device, or um, recurrent strokes. Uh, and then we saw this interesting asymmetry in the emergence of DVTs and PEs that was statistically significant. Notice went out to trial sites, may stay, pay attention to this. You know, are there th uh, thrombi developing on the right atrial uh, part of the device that could cause PEs, all sorts of things was looked for, never found. Um, but this brings us back to there is a subset of people within uh, this patient population where they have an inherent proclivity 
to VTE uh, that may become manifest with long-term follow-up because it's only with long-term follow-up that came out. And the difference between the two groups was predominantly, uh, we think, driven by the asymmetry in use of, of, of warfarin. And the greatest predictor for DVT occurring uh, during follow-up was a history of DVT. So it's something to keep in mind when you see these people. If they have a history of DVT, they may be a setup for having recurrence, and whether that leads you to a different kind of medical therapy is one of the unknown issues. So, yes, go ahead. What's that? No, there were predominantly late events. There, there was a clustering of maybe, f I think, four of the events were uh, DSMB adjudicated within six months of the procedure as being uh, procedure device related. But the others were picked up years after. Mm -hmm. and, and so that was, that, that's an important finding, the, the temporal distribution of these things were predominantly late. And again, it's the power of a long-term study to look at the patient population in, in, a, in a systematic way. So this field has seen many controversies, uh, as I showed with the uh, legal aspects of it. But um, how do we go forth from here? This is a busy slide, but the big thing is, um, you know, what we started in the, the clinical trial was uh, neurologists and cardiologists seeing patients together and we we've continued that it's a PFO clinic where uh, we get together before I, they show me the brain imaging I show them the echocardiographic imaging uh, we see the patients together and we talk to them together so they are uh, getting consistent messages and and then they make a decision and and uh, this is really an area of shared decision-making par excellence because you really have to uh, give the patients the time to uh, digest the, the data, make, try to get some patient specificity to the risks versus benefits and uh, help them uh, decide what they want to do uh, with their life. So we've spent a lot of time developing that paradigm and that's all part of this uh, partnership with neurology. So if I had to outline kind of 10 key questions that go through my mind when we see these patients, it uh, really is a, a combination of neurological and cardiology aspects. First of all, um, was the index event an ischemic stroke based on the history of physical exam and brain imaging? And, and, can, and was the, uh, secondly, uh, there was an absence of a clear cause, i.e., was it cryptogenic, and was it a complete evaluation? And Jeff wrote, Saver wrote a very nice review of cryptogenic stroke in the New England Journal, I think, two years ago, that really gives the kind of evaluation that's necessary uh, in these people. Does the stroke have features consistent with an embolic mechanism? That's important because there's all this esis, uh, embolic stroke of unknown cause that um, lumps includes PFO patients and other patients uh, where it, it has the signature of an embolic stroke, uh, but we don't know where it came from and that some NOAC trials are going on in this patient population. Uh, fourthly, is the PFO present and uh, characteristics and related structures. Some people got enrolled in respect who ended up not having a PFO. Fortunately, it was, it was few, but it, there, are, there are certainly challenges in making the diagnosis. And is there current evidence of VTE in a past history of VTE or risk factors for VTE? And like yesterday, I was asked to see a patient who came in with a stroke, had a PE, um, and had an IVC filter, and so those patients were not included in these trials, those people with overt VTE, and the best way of managing them um, is an ongoing issue. Six, does the totality of data build a reasonable case for the PFO being pathogenic uh, rather than incidental? The ROPE score, the risk of paradoxical embolism is a score developed by the uh, um, Tufts group and uh, you know, looks at things like age, cortical stroke, uh, 
um, risk factors, higher the risk score, the more from a probabilistic uh, analysis, the more likely is the stroke like to be PFO attributable. And it's, it's an interesting way of putting together in a gestalt whether you think this is PFO or not. And does the patient prefer PFO closure, special considerations, and then what do you do if you do, uh, they do want uh, a PFO closure in terms of further reducing risk. So uh, in respect, now we have definitive data. I think that it's more beneficial. It's superior. It's not like uh, left atrial appendage occlusion where we're looking at a non-inferiority. This is a superiority trial. Uh, to, to carry this out in practice, uh, it's all about proper patient selection and procedure performance with zero problems, and um, it's, it's certainly reduces the risk of recurrent stroke, and we want more randomized clinical trial, and I think the reduced trial will be presented hopefully at TCT. Uh, the French trial close will be presented this spring at a European neurology meeting, and hopefully those will add to our, our knowledge. Thank you.